This is part two of our ship's generator engine overhaul. A lot of you have asked about the specifications of the engine, so here it is. On this ship, we have three generator engines. So usually when the ship is running or at sea during navigation, we only use one generator. It's enough to supply the electrical power needs of the entire ship. That means even if we overhaul one or take one out of commission for maintenance or any other stuff, we still have one standby engine in case the in-service generator breaks down or had some issues or whatever. In the previous episode, we have already managed to remove all of the cylinder heads and transferred them to the workshop for disassembly and reconditioning. We have also pulled out all of the pistons and secured them on the rack. Now it's time to remove the connecting rod big end bearing caps from the crankshaft. First of all, we have to loosen the nuts holding the caps in place. Other engine models of the same size or even bigger don't use hydraulic tightening, but as you can see on this engine, the bearing caps are screwed together by hydraulic nuts. Once removed, the bearing caps as well as the connecting rod bearings are wiped clean of oil and measured for ovality. Next is to check the bearings for any signs of damage and do a crack detection test. To give you an idea of how it's done, I asked the junior engineer to do a crack check on one of the bearings as an example. First, we apply a cleaning solvent then wipe it dry with a clean cloth. Next, we spray the dye penetrant. If there are any cracks, the dye will seep in through those cracks. Both sides should be sprayed, especially around the edges. After letting the dye settle for a few minutes, wipe it off from the surface with a clean cloth, as well as a cloth sprayed with some of the cleaning solvent. Doing this will only remove the dye from the surface. If there are cracks, the dye that seeped in will remain inside. The final step is to spray the developer. This will give a white powdery finish. If there are cracks, it will be easily visible as the remaining dye inside will discolor the white finish with a deep red. The big end bearing cap bolts or studs should also be checked for cracks. We also measure the piston diameters at different points, as specified in the instruction manual.
These measurements are used to determine if the parts are still suitable for use. The records are kept in the maintenance history so that the succeeding engineers will have a reference when it's their turn to carry out an overhaul. We need to measure and record the piston ring clearances while the old piston rings are still on. This clearance is also measured after the new piston rings are installed. It will provide a reference to the amount of piston ring wear in contrast to the running hours. After the initial measurements, we can now remove the old piston rings. Some engines have tools for this, but as you can see, piston rings can also be easily removed using strips of cloth. After removing the piston rings, the grooves will need to be cleaned. Next, the piston rod will be removed. Again, measurements will be taken at different points on the piston pin and the small end or piston pin bush. Back at the workshop, the cylinder heads are in the process of being reconditioned. The first thing to do is an initial brushing and then proceed with dismantling the intake and exhaust valves. Once the valve spindles are removed, measurements will be taken and recorded. Next step is to remove the valve seats. There are two ways to do this. For us, we remove the seats by welding scrap valve spindles to the seat and then hammering them out.
the other method is by using an extraction tool which we don't have. Either way is acceptable as per the instruction manual. After removing the seats, the spindle guides are next. Once the seat and guide has been removed, internal cleaning can begin. For this job, only the exhaust valve side will be replaced with new spares. As per our measurements, the intake valve side is still good for continued use. So instead of replacement, we carried out reconditioning of the intake valve spindle and seat. Now it's time to pull out the cylinder liners. We actually had some problem pulling out the liners. Normally, the lifting tool in the chain block should have been enough. But for some reason, all of them were stuck really tight. And the lifting tool was already getting deformed. We had to make slight modifications to make it stronger and turned it into an improvised jack. That did the trick. And once we got into the groove, everything was easy after that. During overhauling, there will be times that the job will be delayed by issues that were never accounted for by the manufacturers. Sometimes it could even be as small as a screw located in a very difficult to reach area which just refuses to turn. Or it could be a special tool that just doesn't work. On board a ship, the engineers have to think of solutions as they don't have the luxury of instantaneous customer support or next day delivery and they have to think fast because on board a ship in the middle of the ocean you must make use of whatever you have Cylinder liner maintenance is carried out every 20,000 running hours. This will include cleaning of the jacket water side and renewal of the o-ring. Inside diameters are also measured at certain points as indicated in the instruction manual. In the next episode, all the measurements and cleaning will be completed. As a bonus, some footage of turbocharger maintenance will also be included. The final steps will be reassembly and testing. I hope you enjoyed this episode. 
Once again, thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next one.